Let's have a big hand for the Yardbirds, please. And smoke sag lightning. Formed in 1963, the Yardbirds were devoted to the blues and were part of a young, hip R&B cult scene in England, which survived on imported American albums for inspiration. With the success of the Rolling Stones, R&B was starting to take off in a big way. The Stones had been the resident band of the legendary Crawdaddy Club in Richmond, when their first single, Come On, hit the charts, launching them on a nationwide tour. This left a vacancy at the club, which the newly formed Yardbirds were more than happy to fill. With the recording of For Your Love, Eric Clapton became disenchanted with the group's commercial direction and left the band. The Yardbirds found a formidable replacement for Clapton in Jeff Beck, who had an affinity for jazz and rockabilly as well as for the blues. Embarking on their first US tour, the Yardbirds took their American sound back to its roots and became an inspiration to garage rock subculture and a prototype of late 60s psychedelia. In 1966, Paul Samuel Smith left the band to pursue a career as a record producer. Chris Strager switched to the bass and Jimmy Page was brought in on second guitar. With Beck and Page playing dual lead guitar, the Yardbirds became potentially the greatest rock band in the world. Unfortunately, only three tracks were ever released by this lineup, but the band was captured by director Michelangelo Antonioni in his cult film, Blow Up. This twin lead guitar lineup was short lived, and in late 1966, Jeff Beck left the Yardbirds to go solo, leaving the band as a four piece. Jimmy Page led the group into a heavier and more experimental sound, including his rendition of I'm Confused, better known today as Dazed and Confused. The Yardbirds launched the careers of three of rock's most celebrated guitarists and set the stage for the album-orientated hard rock of the 70s. This is their story. The Rolling Stones uh, had a, a crazy Italian-Russian 
a Castro-looking character of a manager who, who spoke with a very thick accent called Giorgio Gomelsky. And uh, when the Rolling Stones had their first record come on or something like that, and they went out to the giddy heights of, of doing a, uh, a cinema tour, it left a big gap in the R&B club scene. And Giorgio Gomelsky liked what we were doing and, and immediately said, come and fill their shoes down in the Crawdaddy Club. And the rapport of the crowd encouraging us gave us, you know, great impetus to play louder, play faster, play looser. And within a short time, that crowd became our crowd. I remember Eric Clapton wandering in one day with this uh, Ivy League jacket and, and of course was always there dandy, a precursor of fashion, right? and other people, you know, and um, so we, we know, I mean, uh, we got to know the various things, and when the Stones were leaving, uh, I thought, well, we must get another band in here, but this band has to be really different, there, there must be certain characteristics attached to this group that are, that distinguish them from the, from the Stones, because otherwise it would, it would be really horrible just to have a, a poor man's Rolling Stone, and um, uh, the band that seemed to, the most uh, likely to be able to succeed at this undertaking were the Yardbirds. Uh. Well, this is the old uh, Crawdaddy Club. Basically, they used to get about two or three hundred people squashed in here. Well, these were the old girders that people used to hang on. They've, uh, they've boxed them in since, so they can't, you can't really hang on them anymore. Although Eric was in the same college as we were he was a you know always a fairly shadowy figure he went off early and, and, and did his own thing um, and it was Keith who, who, who knew him better at that time and tracked him down and uh, you know when when Eric came he was like you know he was already sort of a professional musician he was the real thing I mean I remember Eric would literally practice a, a, a two-note phrase for a day. I mean, amazing. I mean, Eric would even practice holding the guitar. Bands start as a result naturally when they when guys hang out. You get three or four musicians that like one another, what they do, then they hang out, then they become a band. To start a band on the drawing board is very inhuman and doesn't work. I mean, it may work for a couple of weeks, but as a business prospect, but it can't it can't grow. It isn't an organic or or a very human way to go about it. The problem that we had uh, when Giorgio finally got us a record deal was translating that exciting sound onto vinyl, which it did elude us for, for really quite a while. Uh, however, we went in to record a song called A Certain Girl, which I suppose was us thinking, you know, this, this, is, this sounds, you know, a commercial viability and it, it's raunchy enough. And we spent a lot of time trying to make this work on record uh, but funnily enough it was the b-side to that a song called I I wish you would which was probably more what the Yardbirds were at that time Baby, I wish you would. 
you would Tell me now, baby, what's wrong with you? You know I still love only you Hugging and kissing late at night I'm standing in the ship in London's West End. This was the centre of the universe in the 60s for us uh, Yardbirds when we played the marquee in Wardour Street, getting quite drunk in between sets and uh, de-sweating ourselves. It was during this period that the great Sonny Boy Williamson was brought over by the National Jazz Federation in Georgia, and we became his backing band. We were English white kids, we'd never played with the real thing, only really heard it on record. And to play with this guy and go on and make an album with him was just an extraordinary, extraordinary experience. The people in the band, I mean Jim, Keith, myself, I think started to, you know, have many ideas about arrangements and areas of music that we wanted to pursue. And when Ronnie Beck, uh, the music publisher, came along with the song For Your Love, we felt that was a really great song that we could interpret the way we felt. And, you know, there was a magic about recording that song. I mean, there was an air in the studio of excitement from the word go. I mean, it just felt absolutely right. Well, Eric, Eric had other ideas for the band. I think he wanted us to do more uh, R&B type covers that, in, in my opinion, weren't, weren't really going to work so well as singles. The idea of doing For Your Love, I don't think he really, he really liked so much. Also, I don't think it really featured him. It was a big step for the band, and unfortunately he didn't really go with it. Eric, uh, Eric played on the, um, on the studio session for, for For Your Love and then virtually immediate, immediately left. Well, you know, we, we had this massive record suddenly and we had no lead guitar player, which is an interesting position to be in. We had to fill that position very, very quickly. And it was thought that maybe we could get Jimmy Page because Jimmy Page was like the hottest session man in those days. And Giorgio knew Jimmy and he asked Jimmy if he'd join the band. But at the time, Jimmy was so busy doing sessions, he said, well, he wasn't really into joining a live band. He said, well, why don't you try uh, one of my understudies, a guy called Jeff Beck. So they went down to, to see Jeff and uh, asked him if he'd join the band. Of course, he was, he was delighted. The invitation to join the Yardbirds came uh, after I finished a sweaty set at the 100 Club. Um, and that time we were playing the uh, Eel Pie Island and all that, and getting quite a good reputation. Uh, I jumped off stage and this, this arm came around me. There was a bearded gentleman by the name of um, Hamish, Hamish Grimes, and he said, can I swear? He said, you're going to be in a top fucking band this week. And I went, oh, great. Who are you? You know, like, this is, this is it. You can't get much better than this. I was really hurt about that. That he didn't make any, any reference to the fact that we just stormed the place, you know. But he thought, well, everybody would want to join the Yardbirds, you know, without even batting an eyelid. And he was right, because I joined. <laughs> Oh, my God. 
think he is the, well, the most unique guitar player. And the most, uh, probably the most devoted. I mean, from what I know of Jeff, you know, he's either fixing his cars or playing the guitar. There's no in-between for him. Uh, and he actually has never changed. In, 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 I mean, unlike myself, who's been kind of wandering around a lot of the time, uh, dabbling in this and that and being led astray, Jeff has been very consistent, you know. I remember Keith Ralph saying, Let's, let me hear you play the blues at the, the audition. I, mean, oh, I played about three or four Matt Murphy lines. And he said, great, that, that'll do. <laughs> I didn't outline much uh, at that stage. It was like, get him in, let him, let him learn the songs. Eric used to do this, Eric used to do that. And I thought, yeah, got to do that for the time being because that was, that was the, those were the crowd-pleasing things, the build-ups, the power chords. Uh, you know, so that was, it didn't make sense to try and argue against that. And, but the, the best was, was round the corner, you know. I heard what a record, uh, Booker T and the MGs, Green Onions. And I just went straight out of my head when I heard that. That's what I want to play, that kind of stuff. Because it was like a stepping stone. Like every day, you know, in those days, it was like, oh, that's out. You can't do that anymore. Can't do Chuck Berry stuff. And I'd got lessons from that, you know, from Booker T's mob and then the Stax thing started, Motown, all that real music, you know, real good pop music. That had some substance to it. And I dialed into that and that's where I got picked up all the chord things that I subsequently used and a lot of my stuff. In influenced by that, by the black Motown and Stax people. Just this kind of block sound they used to get, like Little Richards. It has never been achieved since. You couldn't get it if you tried. You don't get people with voices like Little Richard for a start, but it's not just that, it's the, the locked up sound they had in the band. They gave it that sound. Same with Jerry Lee and Vincent and all the rest of them. The incredible thing about Jeff is that uh, his roots also were, were um, the, the blues and rock and roll, uh, but also he, he was much wider in his musical tastes. 
and he, he also had a mind and a talent that wanted to go much you know further than just playing rock and roll or blues licks and uh, it was perfect for us because we were about to enter a phase of all sorts of experimentation I mean in retrospect we obviously put Jeff through an awful lot of pressure you know we used to work on material then bring Jeff in and, and, and explain to him like for instance the sitar sound uh, that he created for Heartful of Soul uh, we'd originally, Giorgio had originally booked uh, an Indian a sitar player, I think from the local Indian restaurant, and a tabla player. And we tried to create this, this, uh, this sound at the front end of Heartful of Soul, but of course it just sounded very thin and weedy and there was no way, I mean it, it sounded like a very bad cut. So we said to Jeff, can you, can you, you know, can you, what can you do? And Jeff came in and created, you know, this incredible sound. songs coming in from different writers, Jim and, and Paul used to write stuff and, and I just chimed in with my ideas of riffs and just stuff like that. And it's difficult with songwriting to know if you try and apportion it exactly, it is difficult. Um, and very often it's just a, a combined effort, although in this case, still I'm sad, it was definitely just Jim and me. I mean, we definitely turned up with it, but of course the, other, the rest of them playing it and, and contributed something to it. people bring down the biggest amps that had ever been built. I think it was four of them. Big chrome stands. It was like ridiculous. I mean, people were talking about volume that was coming out of this little AC30 and they did kick it out. But these things look like a factory, you know, like a sort of block of flats on stage. 
And, uh, but they didn't sound very good. <laughs> they must have thrown the sound, but, but on stage it, I felt more happy with the smaller amps. But it was the first feeling I ever got of, this is big stuff. We're now in the big league and you're going to get it in a big way. And I think we all felt that and we rose to the occasion. Everybody played amazingly well. <laughs> of people screaming and going berserk. And I don't mind seeing that film. Uh, not to listen to the music so much, but just, you know, just get the vibe of it. I mean, the sound would probably appalling, but we have an appalling up there. going to the States was a huge thing for us because at the time people didn't go to America we just saw America on on TV and uh, American films and going there at the time was so exciting for us especially going to to LA and California in fact the first time we went there we didn't have a work permit instead of uh, playing the the gigs that we had scheduled to play I think we only did one and then we got in trouble with the Musicians Union and end up ended up just playing parties for uh, for publicity sake. But then we got into doing quite regular tours and we were adopted by the American audience who, who loved uh, loved our music. In fact, we became bigger in the states than, than in England. <laughs>
I mean, I, was, I lived in a shithole, you know, in Clapham somewhere. It's really awful. I knew I'd get out of it, but I, it's just one of those stepping stones you have to go. And uh, when I saw how they lived out there, I mean, there were blonde girls driving around in, in expensive sports cars, and you know, 18, 17 years old. Stuff that you would never get in a million years over here. And they were just, they had it. It was the land of milk and honey out there. And smog. It was great. Well, it was one of um, Giorgio's many varied ideas to take us one day into um, Sun Studios in Memphis. And uh, I remember going in. I remember it was absolutely pouring with rain that that night, and um, we were all really excited. And we went in, and we went in and met Sam Phillips, and we recorded. Uh, train kept a rolling and Mr. You're a Better Man Than I. And Sam seemed quite impressed. He was the engineer at the time. And uh, he said, well, yeah, it's a good band. He said, I like the guitar player and the bass player. He said, the drummer's OK when he gets a bit relaxed. Um, well, I think you're going to have to sort your singer out. So, you know. We said, well, what's going on? Well, we realised that Keith had had a few drinks, you know, and. Uh, he was a bit of the worst for a, for a few pints, so uh, we had to obviously overdub the, the vocals at another time. So we did Mr. You're a Better Man Than I there, which became uh, the B-side for Shapes of Things. Yeah, my lonely frame, my eyes just hurt my brain, but will it seem the same? Disgrace my God Oh, and to your passing hands Please don't destroy these lands Don't make them deserts So when we came to Over Under Sideways Down, Jeff actually played the bass, I played the drums, and then we came up with the tune and came up with the words. And we just got a new manager, actually, Simon Napier Bell, and he actually suggested Over Under Sideways Down. We learned a lot about recording with Roger Cameron at AdVision. So we worked from Monday through till Friday about eight hours, ten hours a day. Good. But I didn't like playing live. I didn't enjoy the endless travel. And then if you did have a day off, they'd make you go into a, do a photo session. So it was getting tiring, and there was no space to do anything interesting, like spend time in the studio and get more creative that way. We were really up shit creek without, without Paul. <laughs> we needed that bass. I mean, it was quite clear that we... we we're going to need that, you know, on, on Smokestack, which is a crowd pleaser. Um, so I thought, well, if, if we both play guitar, it'll be quite amazing, you know, to have this kind of like tandem thing going on, you know, crazy one side and crazy the other. 
Who cares about, you know, Paul not being there? Jeff and I had spoken um, before about actually how good it would be if the two of us were in the same band you know, uh, in, in the Yardbirds and uh, at the time it didn't seem possible because it was known as five live Yardbirds and it couldn't possibly be six and, and then suddenly I was there when the whole band, you know, like one of the guys decided to leave the bass player and I started on, on the bass for, just to help them out and then we got into the dual lead guitars and it was fantastic, really, really good. Antonio, he was a pompous oaf. I didn't like him at all. Everyone was calling him Sir, and I couldn't understand why. And uh, the film was a bit of a joke, anyway. I mean, it was all based on his his uh, vision of London, which was a, a bit of Hemmings. I mean, Hemmings was supposed to be Bailey, and we were supposed to be the Who. Why didn't he use those people and make a proper documentary instead of this crackpot sort of joke, you know? Blow up went on to become, you know, a, a film that epitomised apparently this, this sort of, you know, swinging London scenario, you know. Again, it was the Yardbirds finding themselves in this space and, uh, you know, just doing it. <laughs> bit of a joke. <laughs> Crap. I mean, it, it, the people loved it. It kept us going. You know, I thought, oh, that's the, the end of us, because I saw the premiere of it in, in Los Angeles. You know? And we were there, and it, it was great, you know, for a while, but um, I, I didn't like my territory being encroached upon. I wanted to be it, you know, I wanted to do all the guitar work. And uh, when it got to the point where we were exhausted, we embarked upon a, I think, a Dick Clark tour. That was it. I mean, six weeks, six hours in that thing was enough for me. And to be faced with that kind of travel problem and emotional tear-ups and stuff. And then at the end of that, play a toilet gig with, with music. It didn't really feel comfortable. With it. it was a recipe for disaster. Things just got on top of me and it cracked up, you know, basically. I wanted to do something other than travel. Just, I don't care what it was, just get it out of my hair, you know all that travelling and start and think about what I want to do. 
So it's, it's not important as to whether I was chucked out or left or whatever, it just happened. When Jeff left, and we, and we carried on, um, well, the pure nature of the band, they had lot numbers that, you know, you could really stretch out in. And uh, during the time that I, that I was in there, it's, it's just uh, the guitar, then it was a four. It was uh, Simon Napier Bell, who was there then second manager, he came out of the blue to see me one day and said, sort of, um, look, I'm really fed up with managing the Yardbirds, and would I manage them? Obviously, I was very interested, and I arranged to, to meet them. And Simon said a wonderful thing to me, he said to me, and Peter, he said, there's only uh, one big problem with the band. There's a guy and he's a real smart ass, a real wise guy. I said, oh, really? I said, who's that? He said, Jimmy Page. So I said, oh, I see. And I sort of, I thought, he must know I know Jimmy since 1962, 63, you know, apart from Neil Christian and the other things he did. You know, when I was in business with Mickey Most, he did the, all the Hermit's Hermit things, the Donovan things, and, you know, so many sessions. He did all Mickey's sessions. So when I met with the Yardbirds, uh, I said to Jimmy, I hear you're a troublemaker, a pain, I've got to get rid of you. What have you been up to? And he said, well, we did the Anatomy's Blow Up and we did a four-week tour in England with the Rolling Stones and Tina Turner, and Tina Turner as it was then, and the American tour, we got £112 each. And that was really why, he, obviously, he was the only one that had either the balls or the savvy to stand up and say, this is not good enough. Mickey most by them was recording them. Mickey is a pop producer, very, very good, or was at that time, Nixon pop producer. And there was always that, that bit of friction there. The way I saw the band going, the way they wanted to go or continue on, as against the pop thing. Yeah, I, was, I was just hired as a producer, and I tried to make a commercial enough sound to, to get them in the charts. That, that didn't succeed. And, you know, the, made a couple of records, and unfortunately, they weren't, weren't the kind of records that people buy records wanted. But it, that was the intention, was to try to resuscitate their, their career, really. And we found it very limiting to, to stick on to, to, to have to think of hit singles all the time. <laughs> And we weren't aware, actually, that, that the market was changing into an album market. I mean, it seemed to be very, just, you know, all of a sudden, just before we broke up. Um, and then we were a bit fed up with working on singles all the time, and we felt that, you know, another, maybe an up-to-date Roger, the engineer, would have worked a lot better for us. At that time, I mean, we'd, uh, we'd all wear caftans and uh, some of us would have had uh, permed hairstyles. And uh, Keith and I, we used to share a room quite often and uh, we'd take candles and maybe have a few smokes and get into the old uh, psychedelic peace, brother. The thing about Keith and I was that we saw the we were so uh, tired of travelling around, we were playing the same numbers, we may be playing some version of Smokestack Lightning still then, after five or six years or whatever, we've been playing that all the time. And we couldn't really see any future for it. And Jimmy had been in the band maybe a year or two, and we were, you know, we'd had it. And Jimmy was fresh, and, you know, all those guys that he found and the Zeppelin, they were all raring to go. And when the band finally folded and they wanted to try something something new, and I just really wanted to carry on rocking, you know, I had this great, uh, you know, stockpile of you know, material in my mind and sort of songs and riffs that I'd got written down on tape at the time. So it was really handy, yeah. I knew what way I wanted the group to go as well. If I could get a group together, fortunately I did.
his son found him lying on the living room floor with, with his headphones still on. He thought he was just asleep because he'd, he'd often worked yeah. through the night, you know. It was very sad. I think the thing about Keith that I, I always think is hearing it in retrospect, how amazingly good his harmonica playing mm. was. It's, uh, it, it, his pop career was a bit kind of, uh, had a problem. He couldn't reach the certain type of style that was needed for a pop song. He couldn't embrace that, but for wild blues, he could do it, you know, mm. to somehow like Smokestack. Mm. It didn't matter about this sort of intonation, he would just scream it, and mm. it would all happen. Hey, pretty women, standing around you, make love to you, baby, one hour sound. I'm a man, I spill him, hey, man, man. Remember the May Ball, the Oxford May yes. Ball? Yes, yes. Yeah. That was the, that was the end of the road. The curtains there, didn't yeah. he? Jimmy Page actually came to that gig. Did he? Yeah. I didn't know he was there. He oh, came no. there to see the band, and I told him that things were not running very smoothly. <laughs> and there was all this, hello, ya, yeah, you know, kind of Princess Di types all around. <laughs> they were. Oh, yeah. they, they, they were. And there was like trays yeah. of drinks and, mm. you know, proper stuff with sticks mm. and everything. <laughs> and uh, <laughs> there we, we started this... <laughs> And then Keith went, cut the train, smack, it fell straight over back, it was into Jim's drums. Yeah. And I, I, I uh, Mama Cass came, right? Mama yeah. Cass and the and Hollis Cass. Cass was there. Yeah. And when, when we were in the tent afterwards, sort of drinking our troubles away, I said, look, look, Jim, I'm really sorry about this. Uh, you know, I expect you don't want to know, you know, about joining the band now. He goes, it was the best thing ever, can't mm. tell you. Mm. When Keith fell over backwards, oh, fantastic. <laughs> it wasn't going to put him off that easily. I tell you what, it was really great to be, you know, to, to be young, to travel the world at that time, to blow the establishment out of your brain, you know, um, it was just marvellous. I suppose we were pioneers of that heavy metal thing and the, and the psychedelia because there was nothing like it. I mean, people say that, you know, that, like the Elvis, there was nothing like him, but there was nothing like the Yardbirds, absolutely. Complete nuts, you know, using the, the heavy 12-bar blues sequences, spacing them out with wild, you know, m monotonal kind of chord pounding. And um, without any real sort of pyrotechnics or anything, just the sweat and the guts that we put into it. <laughs> 